not going to be importing any Russian oil. Uh, Looks like uh, UK is sort of following suit on that. How important is Russian oil to the market and what does it mean to the average American? Well, forget it. Forget it being Russian oil. I mean, just for just for the moment. But it's roughly 7 percent of global of the oil that's imported into the global market. So oil, the oil prices run. It's a marginal supply business. The price is set on marginal supply. So even a small change in the amount of supply that's available either in surplus or in in uh, uh, in shortage has a, an exaggerated effect on prices. So uh, to me, what is really clear now, Stu, is that this is going to be a long-term issue, and it's bad for consumers. It's bad for the economy. High oil prices are always correlated with uh, recessions and even depressions. I mean, these are these are major economic shocks, and uh, and it's not just oil, which uh, you know we can talk about coal, uh, propane, natural gas. I mean, these these prices of all energy commodities are skyrocketing. Yeah, it really, I mean, it's, it is a really wild time. And, of course, this affects, we've talked about this before, affects every little piece of your daily life, uh, everything from your medicines to your transportation to your clothing, everything. Um, speaking of, uh, of, of Russian oil specifically, th- when you say it's a long-term problem, that's something that hit me today as well in that, like, let's just say, this ends in the next couple of months and Russia decides, ah, we're just going to go back home. I can't imagine this, right, by the way. I can't imagine Vladimir Putin saying, I guess it's time to go back home. It's not like we're going to open this up again. I mean, like all these companies are leaving. Uh, We're not going to just open up and say, okay, you guys made a mistake. You killed a a few thousand people over in Ukraine. And now you're going to be, we're going to welcome you open arms back into the global economy. This is going to be a long-term issue. Well, ab- absolutely, and and the U.S. for all of its you know tremendous energy infrastructure and and ability to produce hydrocarbons of all kinds, we can't fill that gap. And you know the Biden administration. Let me be clear: I'm not a Democrat, not a Republican. I'm disgusted. But the Biden administration's policies on all of this, in terms of oh well, we'll just use more renewables. But that's what got Europe into this hole in the first place. Mm. As uh, Benny Pizer is on my podcast today, and he called it uh, Europe's unilateral energy disarmament. And that's exactly what they did. They drove themselves into the ditch. They did it by over-investing in renewables, under-investing in hydrocarbons, closing down their baseload plants, their coal and nuclear plants, and then decided, oh, we're going to rely on Uncle Vlad for all the gas we need. Well, I mean, this, you, they did this to themselves, and and it's going to take years for them to straighten this out. And what they need to do, you know, and this is not going to the Greenpeace is not going to like this, but this is the reality. They have to start drilling, and they have to start drilling in a big way. Mm. Well, we were told by Joe Biden today, made a big speech. And he came out and he said it's simply not true that his policies are holding back domestic production. We're going to hit record levels this year. I mean, he seems to think he's doing a wonderful job in this in this uh, his arena. I, I, I don't get it. I, you know, I'll, I was talking to a, a, a acquaintance of mine who works in Washington in the foreign affairs parts of the administration. And he said something that was amazing. He said, you know, when it comes to energy, the Biden crowd, they have a lot of tactics, but no strategy. Mm. I mean, they just don't. I mean, they, you know, oh, well, they cancel Keystone XL when they first thing they get into office. Uh, look at the, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission just a few days ago uh, issued a ruling saying that all new pipelines in the U.S. will have to consider climate change or the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The Democratic majority at the NRC rescinded the extension for the Peach Bottom nuclear plant in Pennsylvania and Turkey Point in uh, in Florida. But let me let me just circle back to one other quick point point here, Sue, this this energy shock is about, you know, we're talking about oil. But remember, the coal price in Newcastle, that's one of the global benchmarks in Australia, is over $400 a ton now. And in Europe, the, the price of natural gas at TTF, which is the Dutch hate trading hub, the front month price is $72. Here in the U.S., it's $5. So, Europe is digging itself in wow. a hole, and they're going to be- buy as much coal as they can find on the global market. But right now, there's a shortage of coal in the global marketplace. Uh, you're trying to sort through the differences, because you hear you know, people on the right saying, look, we just got to drill. We got to open up our reserves. Why won't Biden do that? Which I think is a, you know, is a good point long term. Uh, but it's not something that you'd turn on today. Like, it wouldn't all be ready to go right this second. Um, 
on the other side, the, Biden and, and, the, and the left seem to be saying, we don't want to go down those roads because if we do, we're going to lock this in for a long term. And that's going to lead to defeating our you know, climate stuff that we want to get done. Uh, I mean, look, long term, it, the, the sensible thing to do is to open up these resources, make sure that we're protected and independent as much as possible. And in the long term, th- there may be more advanced technologies that come out that we absolutely love and solve all these problems. But right now, we have a problem of a massive uh, energy uh, shortage that's going to be hitting the globe. And it's going to lead, as you talk about in, in, your, in uh, your, your podcast, in your documentary, it's going to lead to real problems, not just uh, with prices in America, but also for people all around the world who are on the verge of poverty. Absolutely. I mean, this is uh, the high energy prices are a, a tax on the poor. You know, uh, I do OK. I'm not I don't consider myself rich, but, you know, a, a, another dollar for a gallon for gasoline for me doesn't you know, I can probably afford it. But think about the tradesmen. You know, I live in Austin, Texas. You know, the, a lot of the tradesmen who work in Austin, they live outside of town. They have to commute a long way and they're driving pickup trucks that use a lot of fuel. This is a this is a direct hit in their wallet. And it's it's a regressive tax. And um, I just finished a piece that's going to be published in a few days. I, want, I don't want to jinx it. But look at what has happened in California. California has mimicked Europe's policies more closely than any other state in America. They did the same thing. Thing Europe did, underinvested in hydrocarbons, overinvested in renewables, shut down their uh, baseload plants, including their nuclear plants, and they're planning to close Diablo Canyon. Um, and they rely to, uh, heavily on imports. They import more electricity than any other state in the country. I mean, they dug themselves ju- uh, 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 their own, you know, their own hole in the ground, and, and they're driving themselves into the ditch, just like the Europeans. I mean, this should be an inflection point, Stu. I mean, this should be a moment in time where the policymakers understand all of this talk, this this myth around, oh, we can do it all with renewables. We don't need nuclear. We don't need hydrocarbons. It was all a big fat lie, and we've been duped, and we need to need to sober up because this is a wake-up call of the first order. And yet they seem to be doubling down on this lie, right? Their answer to this is, well, this just proves that we should be completely green (laughs) and we should not have any reliance on foreign oil. I mean, this is, it's not a sensible point. Well, exactly. And what what happened in in Europe? Why did they, they, you know, they got short of gas before winter? Well, what happened? Wind droughts. You can cover all of Germany. You can cover all of France. You can put cover the Eiffel Tower with wind turbines. You can't make the wind blow. <laughs> I mean, this is like, hello, what are you doing? <laughs> and then Germany just today, which is even more remarkable, the German government announced they're not going to extend the lives of their existing nuclear plants, nor are they going to revive the ones that the three plants that they just closed in December. I mean, when you're in a hole, stop digging. But who were the ministries in Germany that made this decision? The two ministries controlled by the Green Party. I mean, you just can't make this stuff up. I mean, even after what they're looking at now, they're making these kind of foolish moves. It's inexplicable. It really is remarkable. Um, one of the pieces, one of the defenses uh, of uh, that Biden brought up today, and the left brings this up all the time. They say there are 9,000 drilling permits that are out there that these oil companies have that they're not using. And, you know, in the same breath, they'll call them super greedy. And I don't understand why they wouldn't be using them if they're so greedy. What is the truth behind this claim? I mean, uh, not, are there really 9,000 permits? And why wouldn't the oil companies use them? Well, I, you know, I don't run those oil companies. I just have a hunch, Stu, and it's only just the barest hunch <laughs> that maybe those guys who run those oil companies know what they're doing. Maybe they have an idea about, well, we're not going to drill over there because we have a better prospect over here. And and further, I didn't hear anyone having bake sales for Exxon Mobil uh, a few months ago when it was losing billions of dollars and the price of oil was at 30 and in some cases was selling for negative prices in West Texas for a few minutes, right? Now, oh, well, those poor oil companies, let's help them out. And now the oil prices snap back and suddenly, oh, they're, they're reprehensible again. I mean, these are what, what was Hillary's line? What was it? The uh, not incorrigibles. What was the deplorables, it? The deplorables. Uh, yes. The, the deplorables. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's go ahead. Go ahead. No, sorry. It's, yeah, it's funny just because like, I, obviously, like you can't say these companies. He went through this big thing about greed and price gouging and all this. And you're saying these companies are so greedy 
I mean, quite obviously, right, they're not drilling in these places because either they had an exploration permit and they did not find what they thought they might find, or the oil was too expensive to extract and they didn't think they'd be able to make enough money on it, especially when oil prices were low. These are long-term things, but the Biden administration quite clearly is not only sending signals to the, the industry not to drill, but is getting in their way every step of the way. I, I can't explain it, Stu. I mean, I, I've, I've watched this and I, I just, I, I, I can't explain it. I, they, you know, they, they but look who they put in, in you know, their top positions. Um, I'm, I'm adamantly pro-nuclear. If we're serious about CO2 emissions, mm. we have to get serious about nuclear. My line is, if you're anti-nuclear and anti-carbon dioxide, you're pro-blackout. Well, I'm anti-blackout. I am absolutely anti-blackout. But who are then the top climate advisors in the Biden administration? Gina McCarthy. Where did she work before she worked at the at the Biden administration? The Natural Resources Defense Council. Mm. The one of the most anti-nuclear groups in America. They succeeded in closing the Indian Point nuclear plant in New York, and now they they have have helped and it's on track to close the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant in California. Which forget that it's nuclear. It's ten percent of the entire generation capacity in the state of California, and they're going to close it anyway. I mean. It, it, this should, as I said, I, it, this should be a wake-up call. This is, should be an inflection point where we get some serious energy realism and, more importantly, energy humanism. We, these these policies, these high prices are terrible for the poor and the middle class. And I don't hear Biden talking about them at all. Yeah, I mean, especially when you look, you know, I, I, you brought up, the, you know, the guy who's commuting into work in his pickup truck. And that's a big, big deal. But I mean, think about somebody who's living in, you know, in Asia or in Latin America who is, you know, sure. I, I mean, it's going to hit them even harder. Um, before we go here, Robert, give me what... I know you can't predict the future. If you could, I'm sure you know you'd be a multi-billionaire. I'd, be, like I'd, I'd, own, I'd, I'd, I'd own your your television station and this hotel where I'm staying here. I would be, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'd all we'd all be in those positions if we could predict the future. We we kind of know that prices are going to go up. Do we have any sense how high, how bad is this going to be for the American people? Well, uh, I think it was Bank of America was predicting 100, you know, that we'd have 130, we're at 120, what's uh, WTIs and 124, Brits at 130. I mean, it could certainly uh, absolutely go higher from here because the market is scared and trying to find the commodities for of all kinds. But remember, Stu, uh, just this is a side point, this isn't a question you asked, but it's not just going to be about oil. Look at what is happening with these so-called green metals, copper, neodymium, uh, cobalt, nickel. The price of nickel is skyrocketing um, because of all this uncertainty in Russia. So this idea is these claims, oh, we'll just go to alternative energies and renewables and so on. It, it forgets the fact that all of that requires massive amounts of mining uh, for metals and minerals, polysil for silicon, um, for graphite, um, and, and, you know, all of these metals are skyrocketing in prices. So uh, I, I don't I wish I had some, you know, some good news. But I think that only the price, uh, the, the price inflation across all commodities is is going to accelerate in the next few months. That's my prediction. I can't even imagine what this is going to do to the supply chain. We already have so many problems. I ordered a car six months ago and it's not even being built yet. Uh, it could be 2026 right. by the time I see this thing. Yeah. I mean, and and this is one of, going to be one of the key things you mentioned, Elon Musk. Tesla is a long term bet on. Let's clear. Let's be clear on the price of lithium, you know, and that's the key commodity in their batteries, and the price of nickel, mm. and the price of you know, and rare earth elements, neodymium. Who controls the market for those things? Russia and China. China controls ninety two percent. The Department of Energy just put out a report. They control 92% of the global market for neodymium iron boron magnets. Those are the magnets that are the key ingredient in electric motors that go in EVs. So, oh yeah, well, let's just you know electrify everything and, and make everyone drive electric vehicles. Oh, good. So just like Russia, just like Europe handed their future commodities and supply chains to Russia, the U.S. wants to hand our supply chains to China. Are you crazy, man? Mm -hmm. I mean, this... There's no sense of industrial policy with this administration, and there's no long-term thinking about where this is all going. And I, I find it deeply worrying.
<laughs> this is going to be amazing. We're going we're to buy oil from Iran in Venezuela and then electrify <laughs> cars so we can buy a bunch of new metals uh, from China. This is a great approach. It's going to work out really well, I'm sure. Robert Bryce, author of A Question of Power, Electricity, and the Wealth of Nations, also a host of the Power Hungry podcast, which right now I don't think can be more, possibly be more relevant. Uh, you can get it wherever uh, you get your podcast. Robert, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks a million, Stu. Always happy to talk to you. 